Hi, I'm Brian Creer, tutoring high school biology. Today's topic, alternation of generations in plants. See, plants go through this pretty cool thing where they alternate between two major forms, a haploid form and a diploid form. Let me explain. Diploid means having paired chromosomes. As humans, we are mostly in a diploid form. We have paired chromosomes, 23 pairs in fact. Haploid means, you may have guessed, having unpaired chromosomes. Half the regular genetic information. We produce gametes, sex cells, which are haploid, but mostly so that they'll mix with another gamete and become diploid again. Plants, however, will create major growths that are either get haploid or diploid. The two forms are known as sporophyte and gametophyte, sporophyte being diploid and gametophyte being haploid. Let's look at the alternation of generations for the different groups of plants, starting with bryophytes, the oldest evolved form of plant. The dominant generation here is the gametophyte generation. Here we'll have both male and female gametophytes. The males will have structures known as antheridia. These produce male sex cells, sperm, which will float along in the water until they reach, well, a female. The female will have a structure known as an archegonium, plural archegonium. The sperm will then enter the archegonium and fertilize the egg cell within. This starts the growth of a sporophyte, a diploid generation. This will grow out of the gametophyte and in mosses it'll look brown and stick-like, though it won't be very rigid. The sporophyte will then undergo meiosis to produce haploid spores, which it'll then release. When these spores find fertile ground, they'll grow into gametophytes, and so the cycle begins again. Next, let's look at seedless vascular plants, the next evolutionary step up. These still need water to reproduce, but the sporophyte generation is now the dominant generation, what you think of as a fern or a horsetail, that is the major generation. Okay, so starting with the sporophyte generation this time, diploid, it has structures known as sporangia towards the lower end of it. These will undergo meiosis and produce haploid spores, which, when they find fertile ground, will turn into gametophytes. There will be males that have, again, antheridia, and females that have archegonia. Using water, the male sex cell sperm will reach archegonia and fertilize the eggs. This caused the growth of the major generation, the sporophyte, starting the cycle all over again. Next up, gymnosperms, the next evolutionary step up. Now the sporophyte is most definitely the dominant generation. Look at a pine tree, clearly that's dominant. Remember, gymnosperms will use pine cones, or cones of some sort, to reproduce. But something interesting happens here. The gametophytes are very different. The male gametophyte for gymnosperms is recognizably a seed-like thing that can actually float on the air. Females, on the other hand, will have a kind of cone around them. Originally, it'll form a megaspore that isn't quite female yet. It's still diploid, but it will then undergo meiosis and become a gametophyte inside the cone, a haploid gametophyte. The male gametes will then meet up with the female gametes inside that cone fertilization will occur, and then it'll grow into a mature sporophyte, and so the cycle begins again. Alright, last up, angiosperms. These are flowers. And here I have a rough diagram of a flower. You may have noticed there's no big cycle. That's because there's not too much to talk about here. We have anthers, which are male structures, and a stigma, which is the female structure. You probably know a bit about flowers already. The anthers will produce, well, pollen. Bees, insects, and even the wind will carry pollen over to other flowers, and when they do so, pollen will go and land in the stigma, which is very sticky on the inside. It'll eventually then grow a tube down and fertilize the egg, producing seeds. The ovary will then swell into a fruit, and this will drop off, and when it finds fertile ground, the seeds will once again become a new flower. Alright, to recap, plants alternate between a haploid phase and a diploid phase. The diploid phase has pairs of chromosomes and is known as a sporophyte. The haploid phase has unpaired chromosomes and is known as the gametophyte. In bryophytes, the dominant phase is the gametophyte phase. The males will have antheridia and the females will have archegonia. Once a female is fertilized, it will produce a sporophyte. This sporophyte then undergoes meiosis, producing haploid spores, which will grow into gametophytes. In seedless vascular plants, the dominant phase is the sporophyte. This has sporangia towards the lower end, which will release haploid spores after undergoing meiosis. These spores, when they reach fertile ground, will grow into gametophytes, males having antheridia again, and females again having archegonia. 
The male sex cells will then fertilize the female sex cells after traveling through water, and a sporophyte will be produced. In gymnosperms, the sporophyte is definitely the dominant structure. In gymnosperms, the male gametophyte is produced in the form of seeds or pollen. The female gametophyte, though, starts out as a megaspore, and it's actually diploid to begin with, but then it undergoes meiosis and becomes a haploid gametophyte. This is all within a cone. The male gametophyte then, seeds or pollen, will meet up with the female gametophyte, and they will produce a spore. Last up, antiosperms. These are flowers. These, pr these have male structures, anthers, and female structures, stigma. Pollen will be carried away from the anthers by insects or the wind or some other even device, and eventually reach a stigma. Pollen will be implanted in, grow a tube down, fertilize the egg, and then the ovary will swell into a fruit protecting the seeds that have just been fertilized. Alright, that's all for now. Again, I'm Brian Creer. See you next time.